So you can probably guess by now there will be some major spoilers for Squid Game in this video, but just to ease my conscience I wanted to give a fair warning, so here it is. We've seen the survival death game trope numerous times on screen. From Fukusaku's 2000 cult classic Battle Royale to the more recent Hunger Games. Squid Game at first glance markets itself as a similar concept. It's sold as a survival drama and dystopian thriller where a group of people in massive debt stake their lives in a series of children's games for a grand prize. Now some differences may be obvious right away, such as adult players motivated by money rather than children tossed into a massacre, a familiar real-world setting of modern-day Seoul instead of a dystopian reality, and more strikingly as we quickly discovered by the second episode, willing participants in a game of choice. Now we'll get to this part a little more later because it's an essential aspect of what makes Squid Game different, but watching this show as a Korean, there was one thing I couldn't help but notice, and that's how inherently Korean this show is. In everything from its themes to its characters and story, and if you've been obsessed with Bong Joon-ho's recent films like I have, including his Oscar-winning Parasite, or even his earlier films such as Snowpiercer, you've already gotten a sense of how deeply Korean media feels the need to comment on our society, Today I want to talk about what Squid Game has in common with its predecessors, as well as what makes it stand out, particularly as a form of social commentary on Korean society. The biggest difference that one could argue between Squid Game and other survival games of the past is the dystopian setting. We know that this game occurs in the real life, modern day Seoul, and that the motivation isn't a totalitarian regime, but purely entertainment for the rich and powerful. But I want to argue that Squid Game actually does have a dystopian setting, and it's actually contained within the manufactured world of the game itself. You see references going back to 1984, including uniformity, surveillance, a totalitarian push for equality. We even see references to other dystopian movies such as The Matrix. But this all points to the unsettling truth that something like this could actually be happening beneath our own society. Which makes it the perfect setting for commentary on a society that exists just right outside those walls. Now if you watch past the second episode, we know that despite the frantic desire to escape these walls now, for many of these people what's outside will actually be more hopeless and thus we see their return to a candy-colored world with at least the imaginary hope of something greater than their former life. And the way that Squid Game chooses to create this dystopia is through childhood nostalgia. There's something ultimately more sadistic and shocking about seeing this much violence against such a colorful, child-friendly backdrop. A playground, somewhere that's meant to be a safe haven, not a killing ground. That's the world of the adults. And yet these memories of school lunches, traditional music, kids' snacks, all work to maintain that hierarchy and separation between the Red Guards and the Blue Players. Even the language used by the characters is childlike. When the grandpa asks to join them, he says, The connotation of which is like a child or a teenager asking to be included in a game or group. Rules are given, wrongdoers are disciplined, cliques and alliances are formed, and one kid's always left last on the field. Sadly, such bullying and discrepancies isn't much different outside. And while we'll explore this through a variety of different social groups, the biggest gap we always visibly see in Korean society is money. Every time there's a chance to do good, the giant golden ball of floating cash is a literal impediment to their pursuit of justice. This desperation is sadly a very accurate depiction of just how powerful the hold of money is on Korean society. We see it in the men betting on horse faces in the beginning of the movie, but we also see it in sang who on the outside is a perfect Korean man, yet even he's crippling under debt and societal pressure. The nostalgic childhood game concept is supposed to be a sort of escape from all that. Just as betting on horses is an easier way to make money, maybe playing these games is an easier way out of their troubles than facing merciless loan sharks, or even worse, a proud mother with high expectations. The best symbol of this is in the manwon or 10,000 won that Gi-hun seems to keep either giving or receiving throughout the show. 
Manon is equivalent to about $10, and this might not seem like a big detail. But in modern Korean culture, there's actually a saying called the happiness of manon or the happiness of 10,000 won. And it's used in marketing to promote cheaper items that are under $10. I believe this is a symbol of frivolity and the trivial nature of materialism that the young Korean society is so caught up with. When appearance matters so much, having even the smallest amount of extra money can make a difference. And you may even begin to judge your own worth based on how much it can provide for your family. Money is the number one cause of suicide in South Korea. But for what? When Gihun returns with his $45.6 billion, he's only a shell of a man. He has almost nothing left in this world to live for. He may have come out with his life, but he's lost the things that are most important to him. Every survival game we've seen creates its own social microcosm. Within the manufactured microcosm of Squid Game, we'll see representations of age, gender, race and nationality, all of which have implications on their outcome in the game, as well as their role in society outside. We see this most clearly when the players are forced to pick teams, revealing the general Korean mindset that women are still considered physically weaker and bringing out cutthroat survival mechanisms, leaving no room for weak links. In Sebyeok's character, we see both the identity of a North Korean refugee as well as the stereotypes against women. In the original version of the script, the director actually said that ji was supposed to be a guy. Personally, I'm glad he went with this choice and highlighted the beauty of female friendship rather than the usual brawls we see on K-dramas. Although we get plenty of that from this lady. But even she represents how brutally women can be exploited and left with nothing in this society. Domestic violent abuse against women, especially those considered a lower class, still go unchecked in Korea. And the mentality of self-preservation still keep many bystanders from intervening. Women are not the only common victims of abuse, though. Elder abuse is one of the saddest phenomenons in Korea, and is so ironic considering the hierarchical culture that's supposed to respect and value old age. I believe this is due to the rise of individualism and the priority of personal financial gain amongst young people in Korea. And we see this me-first mentality most clearly in a survival setting. The old man knows this as well. He's already been disillusioned with humanity and the society's treatment of the elderly. He knows the only reason he gains any respect is because of his money. But for those out on the streets, many have already been abandoned by their families, even their own children. Maybe he knew that people would play the game because the world outside was already so hopeless. And yet, I think the show is still offering hope over the old man's cynicism. If you look closely at the hat of the person who comes out with the police officer, it's actually the same person who we thought passed by earlier. And at least Ki-hoon, who I'll talk more about later, gets a glimpse of this hope. Maybe foreshadowing that he may go on to try and change things in the future. But for now, things still look pretty grim. To me, Ali's story is one of the saddest, especially because it's an injustice in Korea that goes so overlooked. And that's the life of migrant and immigrant workers. Horrible working conditions, poor wages, and exploitation are so common, and very few visa holders have any rights or protection. They could be kicked off their job and deported the next day, or be undercut below the minimum wage. This is the finger he's referring to, by the way. Presumably injured during work. The worst part is that many local South Koreans look down on these workers because they are willing to take on blue-collar jobs that the young, educated Koreans wouldn't be caught dead doing. In the same way that he's abused in his factory outside the game, equivalently Ali is also tricked and exploited by sang His naivety and trust are used against him to form a temporary alliance, which only lasts as long as he's not a threat to sang own future. This view that foreign workers are cheaters and infiltrators are sadly still held by many Koreans today, coinciding with the entitlement most Koreans feel for their hard work and merit. If you understand Korean, this will break your heart even more. Just how much of a respectful and later affectionate language Ali uses for sang calling him Hyung, which means big brother, ultimately makes sang betrayal all the more cruel. Now I can't say that all the references to other Korean shows are intentional, but there are enough similarities to at least take a small note. Modern spins on children's games have been used in Korean variety shows for years and painful physical punishments are no new phenomena. And neither are name tags and jumpsuits. 
or even the concept of seeing behind the scenes, a unique element of both Korean variety shows and Squid Game that gives us a more human look at the people behind the masks and cameras. Now, since Squid Game was written in 2008, I can't exactly say it predicted this next trend, but the use of more English and English-speaking actors in Korean dramas has also seen a recent surge. Not that it's usually done tastefully. Honestly, in this show, the English parts were what drew me out of the story the most. But if it were actually making fun of how Korean dramas try to incorporate so much English into their shows now, and their romanticization of particularly American culture, this whole thing might feel a little less cringe. Now, this next part is a little bit more theoretical, but I genuinely believe there's a reason why religion, and particularly Christianity, is being portrayed in such a bad light. It's not so much because Korea is anti-Christian, but rather a post-Christian society, with a cynical disillusionment towards many Christian churches that have turned out to be cults, heresies, or just simply materialistic and greedy. Whether this was intentional or not, the irony is that the priests act selfishly and even goes on to kill someone, the opposite of what Jesus would do. The one who showed compassion and self-sacrifice is the one who ends up winning by the end, exemplifying the very core of what Christianity is supposed to be about. The reason Kyun is such a likable character is because he's both so broken and so relatable for us who know we're not perfect, and yet shows a genuine heart for people that grows throughout the show. And even in his growth, he comes face to face with very human moral dilemmas, and doesn't always live up to the standard of goodness he might like to. Do I think the writer intentionally included Christian themes in this? Not really. But I couldn't help but be struck by this one scene at the end, which parallels an exact scene from the Bible just before Jesus is crucified, where Jesus hands one of his disciples to his mother, saying that he will be her son. Similarly to how Gihun gives Sebyuk's little brother to Sangwoo's mother. I know it might be a stretch to say that these are parallels, but I just thought the image was very striking. And at the end of the day, despite the seemingly anti-religious connotations, a message that money is not the answer, and that compassion and love wins, is a profoundly Christian theme. Now I'm sure there are lots of things I missed while watching this, and honestly, I'll probably have to watch it again. But I'm definitely not going to be the only one making videos about this show. I look forward to watching the other analysis and different angles for the many messages and themes that Squid Game offers. Until next time, play safe.